be brave if you're brave I'll be brave but only if you're brave And it could be Just you and me We'll be family Just wait and see So I will fight if you'll fight Yeah, I will fight but only if you'll fight Oh, we can make it through this Like sailors in a tempest Like sailors in a tempest Together And it could be Just you and me We'll be family Just wait and see Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's lung cancer living room, where the topic is, does my tumor have a biomarker? I'm Danielle Hicks. For those of you who do not know, um, my role here um, is number one, to be her daughter. And number two, um, I oversee patient services and support programs uh, for GoTo Foundation. Um, I've been loving my job for a little over 11 years now. Um, so thank you all for, for coming tonight, everyone in the room and everyone online. Um, I know it was said a little bit earlier, but a couple people may have come in. If everybody wouldn't mind double checking their cell phones to make sure that they're on silent, um, because if, it, if your phones go off, I will point at you um, during the meeting. Um, it, it'll all be in good fun, but I'll still point. Um, I want to remind everybody, too, since there's some um, new faces here, and I'm certain new faces that are signing in online, that we mean for this to be a very interactive meeting. We bring this meeting to you each and every month um, from San Carlos and six times a year regionally from other parts of the country and now outside of the country for you to ask questions. We want to give you guys access um, to these amazing opinion leaders, key opinion leaders in the lung cancer space um, so that you can get this information, you can see how this information may pertain to you, and then you can go back and have educated conversations with your physician. So please, please, please do not hesitate to ask questions during this. It, inevitably, it's like the last 15 or 20 minutes of this meeting that all hands go up at one time and then I have to cut people off. So please, if you have questions, don't, don't hesitate to raise your hand. And if I don't happen to see you because I'm looking another way, just wave faster. Um, so we're gonna do things the way we normally do them. We're gonna start with a little bit of it around the room um, where everybody can share their stories, tell a little bit about who they are, why they're here. Um, and then we will come back and Dr. Kelly um, and I've said to you, you all before, <clears throat> I used to ask for bios or CVs or whatever, and then I would sit here and read from a piece of paper who these amazing people are that um, I get to sit up here with every month. And I think it's way more personal and important for them to tell you who they are and why lung cancer matters to them and why they're sitting up here um, with us tonight. So um, we'll end with Dr. Kelly giving us a little bit of information about her. Um, I, I always forget to start with this lady to my right because I do forget um, that she is a survivor um, and I know all of you know her. I had a, um, uh, we, had, we had a lung can meeting here this, this last um, week and for those of you who don't know what lung can is, it's a lung cancer action network and it's a group of advocacy, advocacy groups from around the country and once it, we have monthly calls, but once a week we get together in this room and kind of talk about how we may be able to collaborate and work together in the, in the coming year. So we just had this group and one of the big things we did decide on is has to do with the topic we're talking about tonight and what are we calling it? You guys have all heard it, genomic profiling, molecular testing, comprehensive genomic profiling, like next generation sequencing. It's so confusing and they're all basically the same thing. 
Um, so we agreed to, to call it um, biomarker testing, either comprehensive or, or otherwise, as, a, as, as in unity, right, as a group. So that was one of the things to come out of it. So it was a great meeting. You want to go? Well, it has to be comprehensive biomarker testing. Mm -hmm. Because if you ask your physician for biomarker testing, he may only give you EGFR and ALK. But if you ask for or demand comprehensive biomarker testing, mm -hmm. you get the whole mm -hmm. banana. Mm -hmm. So you want all of the available markers in lung cancer today. You don't want to be tested for just one or two. Yeah, which is exactly what we're going to be talking about tonight, because there's um, ones that we know of, like you just mentioned, EGFR, ALK, and ROS1 tend to be the ones we talk most about, but there are others. Um, and there are others coming down the pike, so so we're gonna we're gonna get there. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna reach over to Don because uh, I'm so happy to see you. We missed you in D.C. Thank you. It's good to be here, and uh, welcome, Dr. Kelly. Um, glad to be here tonight, and uh, I want to thank everybody from the Go To Foundation. I had my 10-year um, celebrate uh, survivorship uh, party last last month, and and the Go To Foundation helped sponsor it, and. Uh, I, I was diagnosed 10 years ago with stage four lung cancer. Uh, again, June, it was, was my 10 year mark. And um, I'm currently on a combination treatment of Abdebo and Uravoy. And I'm with Kaiser, but my oncologist was friends with Dr. Gandera. And I showed, showed my oncologist a report that Dr. Gandera did about the combination treatment. And my oncologist agreed to let me try it. And you know, I can honestly say I owe my life to being here in this uh, in this uh, living room and people like Bonnie. I remember a couple of years ago, I we, Bonnie. The topic was ignoring side effects, <laughs> and I was sitting here, I could hardly breathe. And uh, <laughs> uh, two days later, they pumped three liters of fluid off my pericardial sac. So, and then tonight, I I was telling Bonnie I had progression in my in my lymph nodes and. Uh, and I was gonna get another PET scan at the end of the month, and she said, "You don't wait. You go talk to Dr. Gandera immediately." <laughs> so, so uh, you know, definitely, it's like family here. And I'm here tonight with a friend of mine, Tim, and it's really surreal. It was Tim's ranch that uh, that I um, had my party at, my 10-year survivor party, and Tim's been with me since day one. He took me to my first. Uh, bronchoscopathy at, uh, in Santa Clara 10 years ago. And, um, you know, I never knew how I was ever going to repay that kindness and support. And uh, a week after my 10 year party, Tim was diagnosed. So, and I'll let, I'll let Tim share his story. Hi, everyone. I'm Tim uh, Gonzalez and uh, just was diagnosed this month with. Uh, they're calling it stage 2B uh, adenocarcinoma. So I don't know if there's any mutations at this point. We've already asked the doctors if there was enough material to do further testing. Um, Tim, can you hold that? Sure. There I'm, you go. <laughs> I'm kind of in the wait. I'm in the waiting mode right now. Um, I'm with Kaiser, and, and everyone really has been great. I've, I guess for a person that's been diagnosed with lung cancer, I, I know that I couldn't be in better company. Um, I never, you know, when people applauded me for helping Don, I always would say he'd do the same for me, never ever thinking that he actually would be. But um, so I'm waiting now to get uh, a referral to an oncologist. And then I'm here basically trying to make sure that I know what exactly all my options are. Um, so each day I get a little more hopeful. Um, the first few weeks were rough, I, I think you all know. But um, each day I get more and more hopeful that uh, there's going to be some answers for me. So, But thank you all for being here. Thanks, Tim. Thank uh, they have one. You guys get to keep that. Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Rick Gaddy. I'm with Jennifer, it's my wife. Um, <laughs> I'm her caregiver. <laughs> hi, I'm Jennifer, and yes, this is Rick's first time actually joining me here. Normally, he's home watching it on Facebook, so it's fun to be here. Chicken. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was diagnosed um, a year ago, 
last week with stage four um, non-small cell lung cancer. And um, so far I've been lucky enough to stay on maintenance and, um, and I have scans at the end of the month, but so far I've had no progression and um, feeling really good other than just the couple of days around my treatments and able to still work full time and um, happy with all of that. So lucky so far and hope, hope I can keep plugging along. <laughs> but anyway. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank you. Hi, I'm Larry. I was diagnosed in January of 2013 mm -hmm. with stage four non-small cell adenocarcinoma. Had, um, the tumor I had showed EGFR mutation. My first treatment uh, protocol was chemo. Did five rounds of uh, carboplatin and Olympta uh, with good scans, and then I did uh, Olympta maintenance for the remainder of 2013. 2014, I did a chemo holiday and was fortunate enough not to progress the whole year of 2014. In January of 2015, uh, PET scan showed progression and I started on Tarceva. I was on Tarceva for 20 months and I progressed. Um, I'd had a brain metastasis removed and they did genomic testing on it and it showed the T790M EGFR progression mutation. So when I progressed on Tarceva, I immediately started on Tegriso, and I've been on it almost three years now and doing well. And I just want to say to Tim and anyone who's here for the first time tonight, um, you're in the right place because this place offers hope. And if you don't believe me, just look right up there. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sally, and I entered a study, the International Early Lung Cancer Assessment Program, and after five years, one of my nodules grew, and it was found right away, so I had <coughs> surgery, my lower right lobe removed, um, stage 1A non-small cell adenocarcinoma, and it's going to be 10 and a half years. So I'm doing really great, but I have a couple other things to say. One, Joanne and Ron couldn't be here tonight. They're away, and she sent me an email. Please tell everyone that she says hello. Aww. And the other is save the date for Sunday, October 13th. The Lungfish Society will be holding another social event here in the uh, living room. And you'll get an invitation in the next couple of weeks, but save the date, October 13th, from 4 to 7. And what is the Lungfish Society, if you, for those who might not well, know? Well, <laughs> it started out with Tina and myself that we were going to do a wine tasting thing. And it ended up that Danny Gasparini and Sheila Von Driska got involved with us, and um, the four of us had the wine tasting, thanks to KNL. Liquors, and we did that. I think it was April. I can't yeah. remember for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And so we've been wanting to do a second event, and we had a different date picked out for September. But Bonnie's going to be at World Lung, so we changed the date to when she could be there. And um, if you haven't given me your name and your email address as either a caretaker or a survivor patient, please send it to me at sally at lungcancerfoundation.org. And I'll make sure that you get the invitation one. And anyway, the reason it's called Lungfish, Sheila happened to be at the aquarium and saw, <laughs> <laughs> and saw a lungfish. And they can breathe a long, long, t live a long time and breathe a long time. So she decided we should be called the Lungfish Society. I like it. Mm -hmm. I like it. So that's where our name came okay. from. Awesome. And who doesn't like wine tasting? Right. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. I drink like a lungfish. Yeah, another, that should be their tagline. Yeah. There's another activity we're doing at the next social, which is going to be really a lot of fun. So, and it, it's 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 just a time of fun for all of us to get together and and you know. Not, not talk about lung cancer. We're just having fun and, and, and uh, having a good time. So Social. just one other thing. that I'm not going to organize a luncheon in October because we have enough going on. Yeah. So in the beginning of next year, we'll do one of our lunches okay. again. Perfect. 
Thanks, Sally. My name is Dave. I'm going to have Barb uh, give my uh, bio. Um, but I just wanted to share that I'm glad to be back. It's two months in a row after missing basically all of 2019. Thank you. And if it wasn't for a three-hour nap, I think I woke up, Barb shook me at 4.30 and said, <laughs> move your you-know-what. And uh, without that, I never would have made it today. So okay. anyway, Aww. here hey, you Barb. go. The voice is still a little shot. <laughs> the boss. That's why you have me because I talk enough for both of us. So I am Barb, Dave's wife and caregiver and communications manager. Um, <laughs> just um, tried to do this, I've written it down to try and keep it brief. Um, Dave was diagnosed in March of 2017 with stage four um, non-small cell lung cancer, adenocarcinoma, EGFR, exon 19 deletion, high PDL1. Uh, he had brain metastases, lymph nodes, and um, extensive pleural effusion. Um, major pleural effusion. Um, so he immediately had uh, um, stereotactic radiosurgery, SRS, to his brain um, for the six METs that he had there, and he spent about 20 months on Tarsiva, which was a pretty good 20 months, and then it started spreading. So since then, we've actually kind of been going through a bunch of stuff that's worked for a little while and then not worked very much, including Tegrisso, Carboplatin, and Olympta, then Olympta and Avastin. And where we are right now is that um, the May scan had shown that it had controlled everywhere, but some of the bones were continuing to spread. He had some palliative radiation um, to some of the spots that were really bad, uh, his hip bones in particular. And then um, <laughs> uh, and then um, he just had an, uh, a brain MRI uh, last week, and um, we found out that it has spread in his brain again. So he's, um, what we love is we saw his radiation oncologist this morning, and um, he's already having, tomorrow, he's already having the, um, the scan, uh, the prep work basically to have more stereotactic radiosurgery next week. Um, and it will be just a one day thing to attack the two new lesions in his brain, so that's really great. Meanwhile, he'll have a PET scan on Thursday and based on his pretty dramatically increased pain, we're pretty sure it's spread, maybe a whole lot of other places. Um, but um, between his oncologist, his regular PAMF oncologist, and um, we've been seeing Dr. Neal at Stanford as a second opinion, um, we're pretty sure we're gonna be making a change possibly to Keytruda. We knew Dave was high PDL1, even though he was EGFR. Turns out he's 90%. So it doesn't oh, get much huge. better than that for um, for Keytruda as an option. So we're hoping, we're thinking that either that uh, Keytruda or Keytruda in combination with some other things. And so we hope that by next month, that'll already be kicking in and he'll be able to like come here without a nap. Yep. <laughs> so this is one of those things I hope we get to talk about a little bit. <clears throat> With the because typically when you hear of an EGFR mutation, you don't hear that in in the PDL one. So we'll circle back to that as we're as we're talking tonight. Hi, my name is Rick Meyer. Um, I was first diagnosed in November of fourteen, so I'm coming up on my five years. That's pretty exciting. Um, I am ALK positive. And started with uh, just the lungs, lymph nodes above the clavicle. So I guess I was stage four. They were kind of debating the 3B or 4. Um, I think that was more about trial opportunities than anything else. Uh, anyway, I've been on crizotinib for about 19 months. Um, got progression to the brain switched over to X396, love that drug. I was on it for two and a half years and it was like taking baby aspirin. I mean, <laughs> zero side effects. We're talking we like. great quality <laughs> yeah. of life. There you go. Um, but brain progression continued. Um, went to Electinib, was on that for about six months and could never balance the side effects. It was horrible for me. A lot of people do great on electinib, but I got mm. to the point, if I was on full dose, I couldn't walk. Mm -hmm. So that was mm -hmm. unacceptable. Mm -hmm. um, now I'm on brigotinib, which I'm tolerating fine, but don't know how it's working. I'll find out next week when I go in for my scans. My biggest challenge is all of the drugs have worked perfectly in the body, mm -hmm. but the brain progression mm -hmm. continues. And we've tried blood biopsies. We've tried even a spinal tap to get, mm. you know, cells that way. And, you know, the good news is 
you don't have all the stuff floating around your system. The bad news is you can't get what the stuff is. So it's more like picking drugs based on side effects or you know what might work, but you can't necessarily get the right drug because you don't know what you're dealing with. So that's my challenge. But um, like I say, almost five years, feeling great, loving life. <laughs> and this is my wife and she's awesome. <laughs> that's the best thing you said and you know everybody should always remember there are no two patients alike right. you know so I mean it's, it's, it's great that you're all in here hearing each other's stories but what's working for one isn't necessarily going to work for another so you know that's why we have you know lovely people like, like Karen uh, to figure that out you're all unique you're all yes. very very unique Hi, I'm Rick Bryson. I was diagnosed with stage four adenocarcinoma in February of 2015. Um, I have none of the genetic mutations, so I got to go on traditional chemo. Started with carboplatin olympta, and then olympta is maintenance. Mm -hmm. I had progression in my adrenal gland, and since it was the only active tumor, they were able to surgically remove it. Mm -hmm. um, then I was on um, Taxotere for a couple of months. And in February, a year later, I um, had my first clean scan. And two weeks ago, I had um, a continuing clean scan. So it's been three and a half years that I've been um, NED, no evidence of disease. Okay. I did have... Um, <laughs> I, was, I was able to find... Um, the Adario Foundation back through um, the Stanford um, Lung Cancer Support Group and have found it to be so beneficial and helpful and informative on um, becoming a better advocate for myself and knowing what questions to ask. So, <laughs> That's thanks. Great. Thanks, Rick. I just want to point out something that you said because I think it's really important and I know a lot of you in the room have referred people to this support group and other support groups um, within the Bay Area and those online to this support group and then other support groups in your, in your neighborhood. But don't forget to tell people that we're here. If you think you benefit from it, other people will too. So um, don't forget to mention it next time you are passing a and this a, is the only one. In this yeah, case. this yeah. is the only one I know of, and of course you always get support here for sure. I mean that's a given, but this is an educational evening as well, you know. So you all leave loaded um, to go back and have a conversation with your oncologist yeah. or your surgeon or whomever you're dealing with yeah. at the time, you know, ready to have a really good two-way conversation yeah. with your physician. Ina. I know. What Hi. have you been doing? <laughs> I'm Ina Bauman, um, and I'm so glad to be here. And everything that you said about what the living room is, but there's one more thing, and I haven't been here for three months, and I'll tell you why in a minute, but um, I was so happy to come tonight. I was like so thrilled to see everyone and meet some new people, but you know, you really make a lot of friends here. And the connection is so amazing. So even if you're not lifelong friends, you kind of feel like you are. Right. So exactly. that's a really important part of what yeah. this group does. So yeah. thank you for that. Um, back in April, actually uh, the day after our April meeting, and we had our early detection meeting before the meeting, <laughs> um, the day after I found out that I had a new cancer. I was diagnosed um, for uh, December of 2014, end of December, December 29th, so practically 2015. And I thought, oh my God, I'm coming up on my five, five years. I had a, um, a total left upper lobe and partial lower left lobe lobectomy. So I was super lucky. It was an accidental finding, and they were able to uh, just take the tumor out. And so I didn't need any medication. And um, I was, you know, as I said, sailing along. And then the day after our April meeting, I had had a previous uh, scan for my routine checkup. And they said, oh, yeah, it looks like you've got a new cancer in your right lower lobe. Not a metastasis, but a new cancer. So um, anyway, I, uh, we got everything into high gear, and I was able to have stereotactic radiation. I share 
a wonderful radiation oncologist who we're trying to we're going to try to get him here because I think everybody would benefit from knowing Dr. Dan, Dan Schiffner in uh, Palo Alto, Panth. Perfect. And um, I just found out today, I have to wait three months for everything um, to have an initial scan. And I had my scan yesterday morning and my results were back today. And um, apparently the, the stereotactic radiation has, it's working, it's doing its job and the tumor shrinking and there's no new growth and there's no new tumor. So, you know, I just found that out today. So I'm pretty, um, yeah, pretty excited. And um, I think there's some people that are online who I haven't had time to tell. And I'm sorry. <laughs> I was with my grandkids all day. I couldn't, I couldn't share the news with anybody. So thank you. Well, so they're at home clapping, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. Yes. That's great. But Your phone's probably some... blowing up with yeah, yeah, text messages yeah, yeah. right now. Exactly. <laughs> Tina's crying. Yeah. Nice right. work. Yeah. Oh, I was crying. Um, my name is Tina, and um, I, I don't think I've ever shared my very beginning with you before, but my first symptom was a tiny little knot in my neck and I thought this is like something weird and I was going to Hawaii the next week and so I thought I needed to get it checked out and she goes hmm I don't really like that very much let's do a chest x-ray like within 20 minutes she says oh you have a mass in your lung so that was the beginning but things moved really fast for me and because this was in this place they could surgically get to the cancer because they said yeah there's cancer in that lymph node and they could do the biopsy right away and so the first thing they did and this was in 2010 they they did test it for EGFR but I don't think they tested for anything else because I came up positive for EGFR yeah. Yeah. so I thought okay I'll take it yeah. um, so anyway that was that was my beginning and it, and it went really fast and I started on Tarsiva um, at stage 3B, and then once I got to the third doctor, I just I just didn't feel like that that was aggressive enough. Taking a pill, that's too easy. <laughs> so um, the third doctor at Stanford said, you know, you really could maybe beat this thing if you did standard treatment, radiation and chemo, and I said, give it to me, I'm ready. So I did do that, and... Then after, I had a clean scan after treatment, and then um, he said, let's just, you know, go back to the Tarsiva. We know it works for you. Let's just go back to it and, um, you know, a little insurance for a year. Let's do it a year. Well, that year has turned into eight years, and I'm still <laughs> taking Tarsiva, and I'm still getting clean scans. So something's working. <laughs> And that was that was novel treatment for yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, that area. Yeah, yeah. That, that's that was a amazing. forward thinking doc. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. One thing I'd like to say about the fact that she was actually tested for biomarker. Okay. I'm is that this point. was at this was at Kaiser. Is it Tony? <laughs> not, almost nine years ago. And this doctor <laughs> was right away. She said, Oh, they got this drug. If you <laughs> if you positive for EGFR you can take this drug and it'll take care of your cancer. And I, after li listening <laughs> to all the things I've heard here, that was pretty amazing absolutely. at that point in time. Absolutely. It yeah. absolutely was. So, absolutely. Anyway, I mentioned to one of the cute girls over there against the wall that, <laughs> that I've, I'm going on, I think, my eighth year of coming here. Yeah. At mm -hmm. least eight. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And we probably make it here ten times a year. Yeah. At least. When we're not traveling somewhere. <laughs> right, <Yeah. laughs> exactly. So anyway, the foundation has been a great for my wife and me, and I, I'll be here as long as I can be here. So Rick, that, thank you for that. That's awesome. But I'm, I'm curious about your sunburn. <laughs> you, know, you have kind of a reverse golfer thing going on there. You have burnt feet and then a white leg. I don't understand. Well, were you wearing pedal pushers uh, while you were golfing? My shorts are a lot longer than they are. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Rick. Bridget, okay. you have that back. <laughs> so they've got one. Oh, oh yeah. Michelle's got it, yeah. Okay. Do you not talk? Patient. <laughs> this is my wife, Joanne. She, she doesn't want to talk, apparently. I can't shut her up at home. <laughs> my, name, my name's Robert. 
I was diagnosed with stage four in May of 2014. And my goal today was to come and show people that, you know, there's, there's hope. It's not going to be five months or four months, six months. It's over five for me, but heck, it seems like I'm kind of like, you know, there's a whole group here, five, <laughs> six, ten. <laughs> Mm -hmm. so, yeah. I almost feel like a short timer, mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but um, I've done I've done the I can't remember all the treatments and dates and stuff. But I, I have I've done chemo, uh, radiation, a lot of cyber knife. Most most of my mm -hmm. in in my pelvic area, you know, bone and and uh, you know uh, muscle mass. But I, I have had a couple of treatments that I've not had too many uh, people mention in case anyone's interested. One of is a, a cryogenic ablation, mm -hmm. and the other one was a microwave ablation. Mm -hmm. So if anybody's looking at that or hasn't mm -hmm. done it and going to, I can give you some information on it. Mm -hmm. That's it. Thanks, Robert. Carrie. And I know your wife is here to correct you if you make a mistake. <laughs> she that's did talk if you were wrong. That's what, <laughs> that's what we do. Which is my yeah. husband. Very yeah. familiar with. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's awesome. I was yeah. like, the, I was literally the last one across the finish line. But you Yay! crossed it. <laughs> yeah. But we did make it with a lot of help from my friends. That's it. That's awesome. I have to pull this forward. I can't see this. Hi, my name is Terry, and I just met Robert. And like all of you here, your stories really help. Not only do is it because you all understand. But the way that you talk about your metastasis so calmly, because when we get news that it's spread, it's really hard. But when to listen to you all share your stories about how well you're doing, even though it's come back or it's metastasized elsewhere, it's really an in, inspiration. And his story is really incredible. Yeah. <laughs> so I was diagnosed on uh, July 2017, met Exxon 14 with amplification. Mm. Mm. I had a 16 centimeter mass in my right lung. Uh, they put me on crizotinib, uh, so it was stage four, and the crizotinib worked miraculously it, very quickly. I, I went from coughing and not yeah, stopping great. with no energy and feeling really sick to back to normal within, it seemed like, days. And so um, it shrunk the tumor by 60% in three months. I'd never had chemo or any other thing but crizotinib. And then um, it kept working. And then I had a full uh, right lung pneumonectomy. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry, it was aden um, adenocarcinoma, non-small cell lung cancer. And um, I also, there was an article written, so it, I had a com complete pathologic response. Oh. Oh. So that was great. But just so that was, um, my operation was April 9th, 2018 last year and then I just had a PET a CT scan last week and it did show some tumor growth in the chest wall mm -hmm. where I guess close to where the tumor mm -hmm. was a mass was and so I just learned that last week but hearing your stories helps a lot because <laughs> there's hope and uh, they think they might do radiation but I want to go back on to chrysotinib and I was told by some patient advocates that were here actually that um, if I stopped, it would come back, and I had mentioned that to the doc, my doctor, and he said every case is different, and you know it was a tough call, I guess, because I had a pathologic complete response. So we think it did come back, and so we'll we'll see what we do from here. But I do want to go back onto the chrysotinib, and hopefully it'll still work. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Fred Palmer. I was diagnosed with non-small cell lung cancer in uh, October of 2013. And uh, I was on immunotherapy up to last September. I've been off of all treatments since and uh, everything's stable. I'm also involved in a uh, clinical trial to, to uh, test uh, blood bi biopsies in terms of uh, uh, predisposition for certain mutations. In other words, the uh, you give them a sample of a tumor, and then they uh, do about 13 different tests on a blood sample to see if any of those genes are showing up in that sample. 
we're in, this is still in the uh, clinical trial stage, but it's obviously something I'd be very interested in. So, um, and I, it's good to see Dave back here again. <laughs> yeah, good to see you, Dave. Thanks, Fred. Hi, my name is Tony Rodriguez. This is my husband, my caregiver. Um, I was diagnosed with non-small cell lung cancer in September of 2016 after coughing up blood one Sunday afternoon. Uh, I went in, they said, um, my doctor said, let's take an x-ray, and then they showed a mass, and I went to see a pulmonologist, and he was like, oh, it's probably nothing, but obviously it turned out to be something. Um, they did testing, but at the time, I tested, it was, uh, I didn't test for any mutation. Um, the test, later I find out that I, the test had a 25% uh, false negative, false negative. And so I went on, uh, at that time I went on carboplatin, uh, Olympta, Vastin, and I did that for most of 2017. Um, we had some uh, regression, and um, then I went on Avastin and Olympta for maintenance. And then in 2018, I was on Optivo, and I can recall just earlier this year, I talked to Michelle here from the foundation, and later I find out I'm out positive, and so she says to me, well, you know, that Optivo doesn't work on out positive. I'm like, no, <laughs> duh. <laughs> it did not work. So in 2018, I was on nothing at all, and so I've had progression, and so we're, um, I go on Doxataxel, so I believe, at the end of 2018, and my doctor, I guess he feels I'm getting to, I'm at Kaiser in San Leandro, uh, feels that I'm getting to the end of what he can offer me, and so he does another biopsy, and we send it out for more extensive testing, and it found out I'm out positive. Hello. Yay. Yay. Hello. <laughs> which, Comprehensive biomarker. <laughs> yeah, which is very important, yeah. and um, wow. now, because it's like I didn't have to take chemo. I didn't have to, and I have neuropathy in my feet. My husband's really pissed. <laughs> you did not have to go through all that if they had done the right testing to begin with. So that's why I came tonight, because it's really important getting comprehensive testing. And so um, I go on a lictinib. Um, I started on it in January of this year. And um, by the end of February, my ALT and my AST and my bilirubin was through the roof. I mean, 1,800, 2,400, and I almost had liver failure off of a lictinib. So I get off of the lictinib, and it takes me three months for my liver to um, recover. And so I just started on brigatinib a week ago. So we hope that it's going to be okay. And I've also heard that perhaps because I was on a TiVo, it could have been the TiVo in my system that caused me to have such a severe reaction to the lictinib. We'll find out if that's the case. But, you know, I'm still here. <laughs> I'm still kicking. <laughs> and one of the things I found, um, the, Johnny, the Bonnie uh, Adario Foundation early on, and that's when I was like, I'm not going to let this take me out. You were a true inspiration to me. Mm -hmm. And so then I got caught up in my cancer, and I didn't really check in. I didn't watch the, the um, living room or anything. And then while I was flat out on my back with almost liver failure, I got, got back on the site, and I found the Alk Positive um, group. support group. And that's how I met Rick. We just came back from the Out Positive <laughs> Summit in Atlanta. And I just Gina. want to thank you for Go just Gina. the information that you provide. It has been a lifesaver. And that group has been, they're better than my oncologist because we're like, what happened to you? <laughs> what, what's going on? I was on this. Did you have this side effect? What's going on? So it's just really been empowering and really great information. So I thank you because it's what, you're the reason why I said, people tell you don't Google it. You know, but of course I Googled it and it was like, you have eight to ten months to live, you right. know, 18 months. But I was exactly. like, no, I'm going to be like Bonnie, who is still here, and I don't care what you and Google say. Right. So, so I thank you, and I thank all the people who do the work that you do. It really is making a difference in people's lives. Well, it takes a team. I don't do this by myself. But I want to thank you, because the message you just gave to people in like 140 countries, because that's who we reach with this living room live stream, you know, it is, it is so important to be on the right drug at the right time because you said, you said that the drugs were making you sick. But they were, it wasn't. It was your cancer was progressing because you were on the wrong drug. Okay? 
So that message is so important to share because mm -hmm. you, you have to be educated. You know, like I said, we call this a support group, but it's really an educational group as well. Mm -hmm. You have to know as much, if not more, than your physician. Yeah, and it was the wrong drug for you mm -hmm. based on tolerance, what it sounds like, right? right. But I think one of the other things I want to point out, and then I want to move on because I want to yeah. get to the education yeah, we have, part. We have to yeah, get to yeah. the smart person. But I think it's the um, that you brought up the ALK positives, and I know a lot of these groups are uh, these subgroups are kind of coming together and really learning from one another how not only to live with their disease, but how to work within some of the side effects and some sort of tips that only somebody really going through mm -hmm. it can know, right? So I think it's I think it's really great to it to Amy was that. at the ALK meeting. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> she's, our, she's our very smart person in the foundations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, we're, we're actually uh, doing research with the patient yeah. groups. Yeah. So um, just for their markers. Yeah. So it's awesome. Hi, you're behind a camera. Oh, hi. <laughs> yeah. How are you? I'm Shannon Isaacson. I'm actually a nurse. Um, I've been in oncology for 10 years. Um, I actually live in Montana, and a good friend of mine introduced me to this group um, to take some knowledge back to the rural areas of Montana because we don't learn a lot, and so I'm just here for continuing education um, to hear what goes on in a different part of our world. So thank you. Have them dial in. Oh, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Any <laughs> education ma materials we can provide you for patients, we're happy free. to send out the door. Free. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. I've worked um, in several oncology units in Montana, so okay. yep. continuing to educate and bring knowledge back. So That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Hi, my name's Amy, um, and I'm here as a patient advocate, and I brought Shannon. So Awesome. Thanks, Welcome. Amy. Welcome. We can't get enough advocates. <laughs> There. She's giving the microphone to me again. <laughs> uh, so it's been, so for us, uh, it's been kind of a difficult year this, this past year. Uh, about a year ago, my mother-in-law got diagnosed with lung cancer, uh, non-small cell lung cancer. And uh, she is on kind of traditional chemotherapy right now. Uh, and it's uh, kind of the three agents, uh, and I forget what the names are, uh, uh, which from that she's down to about two right now. Um, of course, unfortunately, uh, my wife, Amita, who's here with me, uh, about six months or eight months ago, she got di also diagnosed with lung cancer. Mm. So I guess we have two in the family now, and of course we're wondering whether there is any kind of genetic connections to all of this. Uh, in her case, uh, she was uh, ALK positive, and the story is exactly the same as yours. Uh, she took a lectinib, was on it for about a month, and then had very similar adverse reactions to it. Um, had to go through a blood transfusion, liver issues, and uh, now she's on brigatinib, and she's been on it for about... Uh, since March. Since March. And so far, so good. Everything seems seems to be, uh, you know, going pretty well. Uh, and uh, we're just kind of keeping our fingers crossed. We kind of come here for getting education. Um, one other thing, I guess, you know, uh, the old adage about doctors make the worst patients. Um, it's true. No. <laughs> uh, the the one thing I think we are very grateful for about being in this area. One is hearing the stories from all of you and also the amazing care that we have. Um, she gets her care at UCSF, her mother gets her care at Sutter, but we are able to go to Stanford as an example to get second opinions. We are also lucky enough that we know some people up at UC Davis where we get a third set of opinions. So it's, uh, it's, it's great to be here and thank you for all the work that you folks are doing. Thank you, thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Jason Rand, and this is my uh, second living room series. That the last one I came to was in April, so it's been uh, a minute or two. Uh, I'm I'm not a patient, um, but my mom was diagnosed in November of 2016, and she passed away in um, May of 2018. And as a result, I wanted to do something positive um, after losing her. And so uh, I've run a number of marathons before, and so I decided that I wanted to fundraise uh, 
uh, and get an entry for the New York Marathon. So when I came in April, I had fundraised, I think, zero dollars. And uh, as of uh, today, I've raised about 7,500. Uh, it's been really great to be able to share my story with friends and family and uh, honor my mom in a way that I think she'd be proud. She was very private about her diagnosis and she, um, you know, didn't share it with very many people. Um, but I'm really glad that people can come here and get the help that they need. And I wish she had done that, but she, she wanted it not to be a, something that would burden the rest of us. So she was very private about it, but I'm so glad that this organization is here to help so many people, so thank you. Hi everyone, I just wanna uh, thank Amy and the Bonnie Dario Foundation for inviting me today. Uh, my name is Francesca and I, I come here in two ways. This is my first time here at the living room. I come as a, care, a caregiver as well. Um, I took care of my grandmother 25 years ago when she had lung cancer and back in those days in the early 90s, obviously there was no testing um, and I remember, you know, vividly being in the doctor's office with my mother and my grandmother and the physician saying, don't even bother telling her she, have, she'll, she has anything. Just, she has multiple tumors in both lobes and both, uh, you know, and throughout her lungs and just let her go peacefully. And it was a very difficult decision to make because my mother had felt, you know, honestly, we should try to give her chemo. But back in those days, there was really nothing. And so she lived about six months after and she died not really perhaps knowing exactly what she had. She clearly knew there was, was uh, something wrong. And so that kind of propelled me into medicine. And so the second way I come here tonight is I'm a medical director for a very small uh, uh, biotech company out of Boston. I do live here in Oakland. So I'm excited and hoping that I could um, come to more of these um, living room events in the future. And we create drugs um, for rare uh, mutations across multiple tumor types, and one of them is in non-small cell lung cancer. And we have a RET, uh, RET fusion inhibitor, yes. Um, and so for me, this is important because as a medical director, I focus a lot on trying to design clinical trials that help you know, the patient. And I feel like, you know, I collaborate with my internal colleagues and I collaborate with physicians such as Dr. Kelly and others, but I feel like I never really have a chance to collaborate or talk to patients. And so while I might not be able to talk to all of you tonight, I hope that just, li you know, listening to you, that I can hear your experiences and that could help, that could help us design be better studies for you because I think sometimes that's, that's largely ignored. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Katarina. I'm another caregiver. I'm in here on behalf of my mom, Ivica. Um, she was diagnosed in November 2018 with non-small cell lung cancer stage four, um, low PDL, one five percent, and no genetic mutations. Um, when, she, when she did the foundation one testing, it just came up positive for BAP or BAP and NF257, but those aren't actionable as I understand. Um, so she did four rounds of carboplatin, olimptin, keytruda, and then maintenance on olimptin, keytruda, and she had a couple stable scans and then some slight progression. So she switched to a clinical trial. She's at Stanford, um, beginning of July with Nectar. So it's Opvito and then their drug. Um, she just had her third infusion. Um, she's handling it pretty well. She has like five days of like flu-like symptoms. So she's really achy and feels like she has the flu and then it gets better. Um, she'll have her first scan at the end of the month to see how it's doing, so we're praying. Um, it's really weird to be in the seat because this is where I sat the first time eight months ago and I haven't been in the seat again since, so you guys are my heart and thank you. Okay. My name's Eric, and I am a lung cancer advocate. <laughs> <laughs> I was just at the National Advocacy Summit in Washington, D.C., sponsored by GoTo Foundation against lung cancer, not for lung cancer. <laughs> uh, I was there with about 300 of my friends, and we were uh, talking to our congressman. I saw six congressmen and two senators advocating for more money for research for cancer. So that was good. And for, 
If there's anybody in this room or on the phone that doesn't know that the, the Bonnie J. Adario Lung Cancer Foundation and the Lung Cancer Alliance in Washington, D.C. have merged, we have, and we now have twice, uh, actually it's one plus one equals ten. We have the resources now to do even more than we were doing before. So he's talking about the summit we had in Washington, D.C. with GoTo Foundation. I always like to joke that the one plus one equals 10 is really easier for uh, Bonnie, uh, who's chairman of the board of GoTo, and Lori Fenton, who's our uh, CEO, <laughs> to say one plus one equals 10 because they get to be the one ones and everybody else gets to be the 10. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, that's good. That's good. Yeah, it works that's for good. them. That's yeah. good. Well, it's working. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Uh, okay, I have to stop crying now. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, yep. There we go. <laughs> Good evening. I am Ken Adler. I am a 10-year uh, survivor post-prostatectomy, a very aggressive form of prostate cancer. Um, I'm also a messenger of sorts. Uh, I am very fortunate to be a coach for a program known as Living Strong, Living Well, administered by Stanford. And we do some um, marvelous work helping cancer-challenged people to build strength, cardio conditioning, balance, and I like to say esprit de corps, mm -hmm. to be thrivers beyond being survivors. Kimberly has the latest training schedule. <laughs> we have just started our new training cycle at the various Ys. If you'd like to know more, you may talk to me, certainly, or speak with Kimberly. Um, in my former career, I was a professional counselor. And uh, I'm a firm believer in support groups. And I think... Uh, <clears throat> This here and now activity is a, is a gift, and I see how well it is received by so many of you. I wish that we had this forum, this living room activity, years ago when my now deceased wife was bravely battling her cancer. Uh, so I salute all of you for your contribution here. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. <clears throat> Pat Pritchard. Um, hello. <laughs> I, last month I told you I was scan scared and nervous and I'm not good about waiting for results and I waited for my scan results and I got them. No change. All they could figure is that the cyber knife treatment left a scar. So I have scar tissue. I don't have lung cancer right now. And I'm very happy. <laughs> and I'll keep doing that. And I want to live strong doing Ken's program and the fundraiser coming up on the 22nd. And do what I can <clears throat> to help you all because I admire you. Thank you. <clears throat> Greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Keith Crockett. It's my first visit here. I only took a few moments to see how important this group is with the fellowship and support that you're supplied, su giving to each other. I'll try to give a brief synopsis of my history. The first event was in 1989 with a brain tumor, which was removed at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, it has not regrown since. And then probably 10, 12 years ago, I developed a, a cancer in my right thigh, big tumor. They said they removed it, and they said when it came out, it weighed over two pounds. So it was right. a pretty good size amount. And then, oh, lose track of time, but seven or eight years ago, it metastasized to the lung. So I've had now... Um, Three, three times of lung treatments, different times where we've had to treat them, where they've gone, you know, been 
put aside. And now finally, uh, one of the old spots has started to regrow, and uh, I'm on targeted therapy now with a drug called Votriant. And <clears throat> three months ago, we started that, and now just recently there was a follow-up CT scan, and it has shrunk significantly, um, probably about, by my own calculations, <laughs> about 40%. So it's a significant withdrawal. And what's been important to me has been the fellowship, the support that's been around me, uh, the church members and prayer. And I think without that, I would have never been able to survive all this. So I, I look forward to coming to some more meetings. Uh -oh. <laughs> Thanks, Pete. Thank you. Um, we'll, we'll go to staff after. Um, so at this point, um, we've got about an hour left, which is about average for yeah. what we're yeah. going to do we for the education part. But I would like um, to again thank Dr. Kelly for uh, coming and talking to us tonight. Um, as most of you know, she's from UC Davis. We've had several of our, uh, our favorite docs from UC Davis um, come out here and, and speak with us. We're really happy to have her here tonight. So I would like you to introduce yourself, yeah. if you wouldn't mind. What do you do every day? To. Yeah, what, what are you even doing, doing here? What are you yeah, doing? exactly. <laughs> well, first, let me say, you know, you are all awesome <coughs> and so inspirational to me. And Bonnie, of course, I can't say enough about you. I'm still trying to get the secret out of Bonnie of <laughs> how she does it all. I really need to, to know that secret. So I'm it's a every time I, I, I don't do anything I, anymore, really. It's, I still every, need the secret. I just get credit for everything. All right. <laughs> but I want to say I've actually been doing this uh, for 30 years. So I started my career at the University of Colorado 30 years ago. And I want to say that even 30 years later, I'm still as passionate about what I do as I was back then. And I have a niece and nephew who I'm very close to. I have a identical twin sister. And so my, my, her children are really my children. And they are both in medicine. And they're both at the crossroads of trying to decide what they need to do. And so my advice to them is you have to do something that you're passionate about because you're going to be doing it a long time. And I tell them my story about how passionate I have been. And they've seen this through the 30 years that every day I'm just as passionate. And I'm passionate because you are all on the forefront of my mind. Every, every day I wake up in the middle of the night many times trying to think, what else can I do? You know, how can I leverage something else? How can I, how can I you know, try to do maybe something a little bit off the beaten path that might still be helpful? So as I said, I started my career 30 years ago at the University of Colorado. And at that time, a young man named Paul Bunn, at that time, <laughs> many of you, some of you know Paul very well, who He's was in God charge of the lung cancer, cancer center. And he truly is an icon in the world of lung cancer. And so he was my mentor. And we you know, went down the, this uh, path to where I'll never forget, and I think I told this story in, in DC as well, is sitting in one of the physician's rooms at the university writing you know, cisplatinum and etoposide, because that was the only thing there was to write, mm -hmm. you know, and that half the patients didn't get it. And I said, you know, I, I just can't be doing this for the rest of my life. I can't be writing cisplatinum and etoposide. This isn't right. And so Paul and I, again, forged forward. And I do remember the early days, because we participated. We were one of the early sites for gefitinib, mm -hmm. the very first EGFR inhibitor. And we said, oh my gosh, really? We were saying the same thing, really? A pill? A pill, no. You know, that's never going to work. <laughs> and, and I also remember the days I'd given everything. For immunotherapy, I, I would say, oh, no, this will never work. I've done it all. I gave IL-4. I've given autologous vaccines. I've done all of this, and it never worked. But it's just through technology and patients helping and giving samples that we were able now to make all this huge pros progress, going from one regimen, cisetoposide, to now all of these options. It has truly been, you know, you know, an amazing career. 
I'm, you know, that I continue on and now is the most exciting time I could ever say because of all the <clears throat> great options that we, we do have and all the great science. But, you know, back then it really was just about science and today it's not just about science. It's about how you and your voice actually help us do better, do better trials, do better treatment, take into account all of the things that you all are dealing with, the toxicity issues you know, uh, that you are dealing with, I have a patient who had exactly the same thing on the electinib, who, whose liver numbers went high like that too. So again, uh, it's really about your voice. And remember, your voice has made a difference in patient reported outcomes. Again, if you guys didn't speak up, that wouldn't have ever been important. And it is important because again, the FDA now thinks it's important. So mm -hmm. you have a lot of power that is, it's good power. It's good because we work together. This has got to be uh, us working together. And that's why we've accelerated this so much because you all have, have really been the guiding force in saying this isn't good enough and we need to come together and make it better. And I so appreciated being there uh, in July to be at the DC and it was just so inspirational and to tell our you know colleagues in the Congress that we need more particularly in this such exciting time that we're in and what we learned in lung cancer can also help in other cancers as well so I just want to say thank you thank you thank you and you know I'm, I'm always here for anybody you know, anything I can do, just just let me know. Thanks, Karen. I want to. Um, she means that. I guess yeah. she does. I want to ask Michelle if anybody online wants to say hello before I give a shameless plug based on something Dr. Kelly just said. No, we have a okay. lot people. We'll, lot. Okay. We'll move right along to shameless plugs. So okay. I'm going to give a shameless plug because I think what Dr. Kelly just said about patient-reported outcomes is important because it is the, sort of this new space that people are starting to really pay attention to where it's guiding decision making registry. and mm -hmm. and go to foundation um, has a patient registry where we are asking you these questions so if you have not signed up I highly encourage you to participate in the registry there's a baseline survey if you're on immunotherapy there are surveys after the cut you know about immunotherapy there's quality of life there's surveys coming down the pike mm -hmm. and the docs are listening to you and that's where they're listening so mm -hmm. um, if you haven't registered and you want to register um, and you're here in the room talk to us tonight if you're watching online um, or you're watching um, back a recorded mm -hmm. version just contact us at info at uh, gotofoundation.org and we will make sure to get you set up so and Oh. Just one more thing about the registry, because when you, when you go online and when you become a member of the registry, you can see what other people are doing that have mm -hmm. your same markers, or, mm -hmm. or you can look up the ALKs, or the, the resistors, or the Ross Wonders, or the KRASers, mm -hmm. or you, know, you can look up immunotherapy. You can actually find out mm -hmm. how your, your, you know, your patient partners mm -hmm. are doing, mm -hmm. and what, what drugs they're on, and what you might uh, yeah. want to ask it, your physician mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. And it's a global registry. So yeah. it's mapped out, not just in the U.S., but you can see how people in other parts of the world are, are, are doing as well. So with that, I want to jump in to, to what, we're, what we're here to talk about tonight, and that is uh, comprehensive biomarker testing. Good girl. And yeah, just, um, right just blah, blah, blah. Yep. Um, and, so I, and I know a lot of you in the room um, bear with us, because I know you've heard some of this before, but maybe somebody new uh, watching or somebody that's going to come back and watch hasn't heard it. So... I would like Dr. Kelly to talk about what is biomarker testing and who should get tested. Yeah. So it's a two-part question. So again, biomarker testing is the additional pieces of information that we get beyond just whether you have, I've heard people say adenocarcinoma, okay? So it's beyond just microscopic looking at your tumor under the microscope. We would call that kind of crude today because 
again, we have such better technology that we can go to this genetic level. And so biomarkers are really the genetics of your own tumor. Just like everybody in the room looks different because of genetics, your tumor is different because of genetics. And so we want to look at the genetics of your tumor, and that's why we call it a biomarker. Now, tumors, again, typically when we talk about biomarkers, we are just, we're, we're really talking about the, the tumor itself, okay? And we're talking about really genes. And, and so that's where we call it this genetic testing. Don't confuse that though with germline testing, okay? Germline testing are, is what we do when we're concerned or wanting to know about genes that you inherit that cause disease, all right? That's very, very different from looking at genes in your tumors. And patients do get confused mm -hmm. about, uh, about that. A frequently asked question on the, when you do the comprehensive mm -hmm. testing is, well, you know, can somebody inherit that EGFR mutation, okay? Or that ALK mutation is, should, should my family members get tested? And that's not the type of testing we're, we're doing. We're only looking at tumor testing. So I hope that, that is, that's very clear, that can't tell you anything about your family, can't tell you if you're at high risk for diabetes, <laughs> can't do any of those things, but we can tell you the most important thing, and that is what is your tumor makeup. So, so that's what we're looking at when we talk about comprehensive biomarker testing. Who, who are we currently testing for these biomarkers? Yeah. So uh, when I see a patient, the very first question that I want to know is, you know, what you've all said. I want to know, A, number one, is it non-small cell lung cancer? Because that's about 84% versus small cell lung cancer. So that's just under the microscope. I want to know if it's adenocarcinoma versus squamous cell. So those are the big the big groups, all right? So all adenocarcinomas, or again, we also call it non-squamous, should be tested in a comprehensive manner, okay? So all the adenocarcinomas should be tested for these mutations, and you've already heard EGFR, uh, insertion 20, MET, and ALK, but we also have BRAF, we have a very rare one that's not seen a lot in lung cancer, but uh, NTRAC, those are now the approved mm -hmm. uh, uh, biomarkers. But then we're looking for the other ones, and there's a list of, RET is on that list. Um, also, HER2 is on that list. And there are some other newer ones that are on this list as well. So that list has become, it's a growing list. So that's why you gotta do that multiplex next generation sequencing. Now, squamous cell cancer, unfortunately, <clears throat> we have not been successful in squamous. Does anybody have squamous here? Anybody with a squamous cancer here? No, okay. But squamous cell, we haven't been successful in finding these uh, driver mutations. That's what we call them, driver mutations. We have not been successful. Albeit, we've looked, we continue to, to uh, work on that every day. So for the squamous cell patients, the only biomarker we do is that PDL1 testing, okay? So PDL1 for squamous, that's all they get, okay? So on the adenocarcinoma side, we get that NGS sequencing, and we do get the PDL1 testing too. So that would be what we would do, all right? And again, we want to know up front what you have before you get treated. Now, again, the issues become, of course, is that if you do this tissue test, the tissue testing, it takes three to four weeks, all right? That takes time, and you're anxious, and you want to get started, and, and we, we truly understand that. I do think now with the blood testing that we can get, so now we have blood tests. It's the NGS of the blood testing, and there's several companies that do that, 
and the turnaround time there is only like seven days. So now there are caveats to both of those, but we're getting better at all of that. Because remember, at the end of the day, uh, it's hard to wait. One of my most upsetting things is when I see a new patient, I have to say, uh, yeah, you have adenocarcinoma, but we have to send it off <laughs> to get tested. And it might take three or four weeks to get a result back. And that is very, very hard. So I, you know, it, it's very, really uncomfortable, but you have to let you guys know what, what's out there. Typically what I tell patients is I say, if you can wait, it's absolutely important to wait to get these results so you don't get the wrong therapy up front, all right? I always tell patients, particularly if they're a little symptomatic, to say, remember, we got this chemotherapy backup plan if you need to go to it, but we'd rather wait to have the results. But if you really are, you know, tomorrow, the next week, and you're just not feeling well or you're too anxious and you're more stressed out, and you really feel you want to start the chemo, we, we can do that too, you know, so, but we try to get the patients to wait when we know that we have a really high suspicion that you're going to have a mutation. Did you have a question? Yeah, so just a quick thing on that subject. So I was just at the ALK conference down mm -hmm. in Atlanta, and according to statistics down there, they're saying roughly 50% of patients, unfortunately, either because of their doctor or their location or whatever, mm -hmm. don't even get the biomarkers. Right. And then with the 50% that do, the timing goes anywhere from they get test results within a couple of weeks mm -hmm. or sometimes it's like a three-month process. And so if they can't work on, you know, how do we get mm -hmm. the world mm -hmm to understand that A, you need to do 100% testing, mm -hmm. and B, you need to get it done mm -hmm. in a timely fashion, because, you know, they, well, we'll do a biopsy in three weeks because we're busy, and then we're gonna send it off to whatever, and mm -hmm. we'll get those results, and then, oh, I'm busy, I can't see you for a couple mm -hmm. of weeks yeah. after that, and next thing you know, it's three months later, mm -hmm. yeah. and that's a lot of progression. Right. So a lot of people end up going on something like Mm -hmm. chemo, chemo or whatever um, in the interim because it's just not happening fast enough. Right, right. What can we do to make right. that better? Right. So great question. That's a great question. So you may know that all of the societies have demanded that it's a 14-day turnaround time on the tissue to get results, okay, on the tissue. Um, but you have to give an extra week to get the sample to the site. So we need to continue to work harder on decreasing that turnaround time on the tissue. And every company is totally aware of that and working on that. Now, the other thing is, with because we have the blood testing now, where you can get the results in seven days, you, another thing to, to ask your doctor is to say, why don't we do both? Okay, why don't we do both and, and see what they say? You'll ha because if you get the answer in the blood in seven days, you have an EGFR or an ALK, you're good to go, all right? Remember, but if you don't, then you do have to wait for that biopsy uh, result testing to see if you have anything mm -hmm. really there. So I think the liquid biopsies are really gonna help us uh, make this faster, mm -hmm. all right? So I, I think that that is one thing um, that's very, very important. And all of the societies have really been very clear about, you know, we have to shorten these timelines. Yeah, we can only be as fast as technology yeah. will allow. Yeah, we can allow. only be as fast. But I think second to that, and, and a one thing I just want to kind of reiterate to make sure everyone understands between the liquid space and the, and the, the tissue space is that Tissue is still sort of the gold standard. It is the gold standard. So what Dr. Kelly was saying is, if they do a blood test and something shows up, you can be sure it's there. But if they don't see something, mm -hmm. you can't be sure it's not no. there. So exactly. you have to go back to the you tissue have for confirmation tissue, of whether yeah. or not. Tissue's always the gold yeah. standard, absolutely. Yeah. This is not, uh, you, you, we always want tissue first. Yeah. But again, the blood testing, I think, has really been a complement 
to the, the tissue mm -hmm. for us. Or particularly, mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously if you don't have enough tissue, absolutely you have to do the blood test, all right? Or be rebiopsied, and we try to mm -hmm. avoid that. So, mm -hmm. yes, there's two questions. So you said, you know, why don't we do both? And I don't know what everyone else's experience has been, but who pays for that? Yeah. Because um, I know that, um, you know, we've had um, liquid biopsies done twice, and both times Blue Shield did not pay. And um, the first time, um, you know, we never got a bill from Foundation yeah. Medicine. We just didn't. Um, and the second time, we had a doctor who said, we need to check it again, and we're going to do it. And if it doesn't get paid for, I have money. Don't worry, which was amazing. But, I mean, I know everybody doesn't have that luxury, so... Yeah. But everybody yeah. might. <laughs> yes. So go to Foundation. Um, we have a program, and it's Treatment and Clinical Trials Navigation. And one of the services that we're able to provide as a joint organization is not only a concierge service to anyone who calls in to look for clinical trials um, that they would qualify for within whatever distance they are looking at, but also access to biomarker testing um, that we can provide with our partners for free to patients. And, and the companies are good at working with you. Most of the time, patients uh, don't get a bill, all right? Mm -hmm. You get this appeal, but you don't actually get the bill. And so it does get taken mm -hmm. care of. That's probably what you got. Uh, so at this point in time, and again, if Medicare patients, again, are not what I've been told is they aren't getting bills. You guys may know more about that than I do. Well, well, these are all things we have to advocate for, mm -hmm. okay? Because just to go back to the biomarker testing and why it takes mm -hmm. so long. When, when you've had a biopsy or surgery and they have the tissue, um, the first thing that, you know, you're in the operating room and that goes over here and they have to prepare it and they have to send it to pathology. Mm -hmm. Because what pathology does is they decide whether it's adenocarcinoma or, or squamous or, squamous or right. small cell or whatever. Large cell or, or yeah. whatever. So, I mean, that's one thing. That's not biomarker right. testing. Sometimes people get confused. Right. They ask their physician, was I tested? And they go, oh, yeah, sure, you have adenocarcinoma. <laughs> no, that's not the test. We're right, right. For. Yeah. Although that's important. <laughs> That's so then the next test where is where the um, pathology lab has to actually send, send the, the tissue or the blood out and yes. get it done. It's a process. Mm -hmm. It's a process. Can it be sped up? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and we need to advocate for those things. We have to, you know, bring pathology in closer to us and let them know yes. how important it is that they move yes. quicker. Yes. Because patients are waiting for that information to get on the right drug at the yes. right time. Yes. I, I want. I know Katerina has a question, but while we're talking tissue blood, mm -hmm. I just want to kind of put out there: is one of the reasons that maybe getting both could be potentially more beneficial? And I don't know the answer to this due to maybe some of the heterogeneity within a tumor itself, could that be, like, could there be a benefit to getting a blood biopsy along with a tissue biopsy anyway? Because maybe we don't know where we're going in the, t in the tumor. Well, I, I'm not so sure about, I'm not so sure about, about that. Mm -hmm. I think the reason to get it is really, in my opinion, is, mm -hmm. is simply a time. Mm -hmm. It's simply a time. It's faster to get it. Now, again, there are caveats to all of yeah. these things, but yes, it's really to me, I'm trying to advocate to say, I've got this patient, I don't, it's really uncomfortable because you want to treat the patient and you have to, you're waiting a month, we're waiting a month, we don't like waiting either, we're mm -hmm. on your side. So my only reason for getting the blood is to get a result faster to you so that you can be treated. Mm -hmm. That's my sole purpose. I only ask because, I mean, how often do we hear, oh, they, it was, the tissue was no good, it was necrotic, yeah. or yeah. you hear yeah. stories Yeah, about well, that's, that is, uh, again, uh, yes. So if the tissue is necrotic, it's not gonna be sufficient. You absolutely have to get the, the, the blood, liquid, yeah. absolutely. And so we always have to look at the pathology report and we've advocated for this. But remember the IASLC, the College of uh, Physici uh, American right. Pathologists mm -hmm. have all said 14 day turnaround time and to in 
make sure that their processes are more efficient. So what I do is, again, looking at that pathology report, I know there should be on the bottom, it should say, there is enough tumor tissue left to do molecular testing, yeah. all right? Again, we've tried to make that standard and our reports do say that. So I know or I can tell, you know, I'm pretty good at judging if there's going to be enough tissue to do the test because that's the other thing I have to tell a patient too. So while I'm telling the patient that EG it might be a month, I'm also telling them, but in a week from now, they may come back and say you have insufficient tissue and that you don't want to tell a patient either. Mm -hmm. So my whole point is I'm just trying to get the test results as quick as I can for the patient. Biggest bang for your blood. And you never have insufficient blood. blood. Yeah. yeah, you never have insufficient because blood. Because your blood is repairing yeah. itself every yeah. day. And so, no, Katerina has yeah. a question, and then Don will go to yeah. you next. Um, so I have a couple of questions. One is just to clarify about the blood slash liquid biopsy, about how um, certain it is, because when my mom did the garden mm -hmm. test, it came back like 0.2% of HER2, and then the tissue showed that it, she didn't actually have it. And then the other two very quick small questions is, it took us a while to realize that liquid meant blood and it didn't mean fluid, because my mom had pleural effusion, mm -hmm. so we actually used her fluid mm -hmm. to do the foundation when testing, which we were kind of like, but wait, why didn't we do the tissue? And I won't go into the whole backstory because mm -hmm. she didn't have enough tissue. Mm -hmm. So if you can just kind of speak to that and clarify it, mm -hmm. because it took us a long time to understand blood versus fluid versus tissue. Right. And then the... Um, Third thing is, I don't know if tumor, tumor mutation burden has anything to do with any of this, but that was also something that we were a little bit like, well, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. a little bit confused. So yeah. sorry about yeah. the questions, but. So, it, no, those are great questions. So we consider um, a plural fluid. I can see where you'd be confused about mm -hmm. plural fluid because it's a fluid and blood's a fluid. So I, I get it. But um, plural fluid is again considered a, because there are cells in there that you can look at under the microscope. Maybe that's the simplest way to put it. Anything that you can look at under the microscope uh, is, is kind of more of a pathology. It's pathology. So pleural fluid, uh, spinal fluid, uh, uh, ascites fluid, any type of body fluid goes to pathology to be looked at under the microscope, just like tissue. Mm -hmm. Blood, they don't even see it. Uh, th this testing for NGS via blood, Dive. pathology never even gets the sample, all right? It just goes to the company. You put it in a box, you draw it, you put it in a box, and it goes to the company. It never goes to pathology. Does, does that kind of help? Um, and, I, and I ask that also to help people out there because yeah, exactly. we spend a lot of time and working with the people here understanding that. And insufficient tissue uh, doesn't, oh. it doesn't necessarily mean you don't have a biomarker. Um, you have to get into, you know, you can have a, a, an entire tumor and one half of it looks completely clear mm -hmm. and the other half looks, you can see the disease in it. Mm -hmm. If you don't hit the right spot, looking for the tissue, you don't always get the information you need. And I think this is important to discuss because when you get frustrated mm -hmm. and you're, you know, you're in the doctor office and you're, you're seeing progression mm -hmm. and they're not sure and they keep coming back mm -hmm. saying, we're still looking, mm -hmm. there are reasons for that. Mm -hmm. But with the blood, um, it's a little bit different, but it can be the same. You know, the, 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 the section of the blood they've mm -hmm. tested mm -hmm. might not be the section of maybe blood. Maybe it's not shedding the, enough, the, the tumor's not yeah. shedding yeah. enough. So, yeah. so no test is perfect, right. and, mm -hmm. and each test does have its caveats, and you're pointing out some of those caveats uh, with the blood test that didn't match <clears throat> the tumor tissue. But to Bonnie's point, that could be, that could be why. Right. Now, uh, it used to be that foundation medicine or uh, any of the other vendors as well, uh, tissue really was tissue. And it's hard to get enough cells from the pleural fluid, but they've gotten so much better technology-wise. They can do a lot with just <clears throat> a tiny, right. tiny bit. And so now fluids, uh, again, they spin down those cells. That makes a block. It's called a block. That's like a tissue. You cut the, that too, just like you cut tumor tissue, and you send that off. So, and, and they're really good about trying to, you know, take little tiny bits 
to get these results. Now, tumor mutational burden, which is your other question that you asked. Um, on a next generation sequencing uh, report, just be, they will give that to you because that's kind of a freebie. The information is already there because they've looked at all those, those genes. And so it's just, it's a calculation that they do. And so they just put it on the report because, because it's there and available. And there is some controversial clinical data about uh, tumor mutational burden. So that's why we, you know, you look at it and if it corresponds and kind of corresponds to the PDL1, that's great. But we don't use tumor mutational burden by itself uh, to make any treatment decision. The only approved one for immunotherapy is, of course, that PDL1 by IHC. Did I answer all your questions? Is it, yeah, that was great. Uh, so I have a question based on TMB. Again, this kind of points back to when, when, a little bit ago when we were talking about squamous. Yeah. Because who do we test? What are we testing for? And it's not to say that squam patients don't have any mutations ever, and they tend to have a higher tumor mutation burden, right? Right. So squamous cell patients, so never say never. The group of squamous cell patients that we would automatically do NGS testing is any young patient, okay? okay. Young patients, we always test for... for uh, by Every NGS case. sequencing, mm -hmm. all right? And never smokers we would test because you can find EGFR, you can find the, these other mutations. So we always do tests for, for those two caveats, I would say. Okay. Um, because we don't routinely test squamous cell, we don't routinely test them for via next generation sequencing, you can't get that TMB and we would never order just to get the TMB. We'd never order, don't ever order NGS sequencing just to get TMB. That's that's not done. Got it. Uh, unless and I, I think it's important for you to talk a little bit about immunotherapy. Yeah. Because um, you know, obviously, with all of these direct-to-market commercials on TV, yes, patients are thinking, "Oh my God, this is the answer." You know, I want yes immunotherapy. I want to go to IO, but, I, but before we switch gears, I want to ask, let Don ask his question. Uh, this is my question, but I, on the periocardial fluids, I oh, had yeah. them spun down two years mm -hmm. ago into a uh, paraffin embedded block, yep. and foundation was able to test it for the same mutations as, uh, yeah. as if it was yes. tissue. Yeah. But my question is, and there's somebody here from a, a company that's got a new red drug, mm -hmm. and Brilliant. now Entrax been yep. approved. Mm -hmm. So when is it going to be not cost effective for these community centers to do sequential sequencing when there's there's already an issue with not enough tissue, and with sequential sequencing, you have to use it for EGFR, L, for us one. They have to use a piece of tissue for every one of those, mm -hmm. compared to next generation sequencing, where they can test for the whole 324 it, with one sample. So, when is it going to be cost effective for these community places to just go to Foundation yeah, Medical so, do Garden? It. Yeah, so we've already, I think, proven that it's cost effective. There was a paper that just came out uh, by Dr. Pennell uh, from the Cleveland Clinic who reported this. They did this mock uh, modeling and showed that it, it was clearly cost effective and tissue sparing to do the comprehensive NGS sequencing. And I will tell you, in the meetings that I've been to recently with community doctors, they, ha the ones that I've been talking to really have moved to doing uh, NGS. NGS. So Which is I, next gen next sequencing. Next generation sequencing. So uh, there is momentum. In fact, I did an audience response poll on this. It's several uh, um, lectures that I was giving and the overwhelming majority. I was, a I was a little surprised to see that, but very happy to see mm -hmm. that, that they've already made this move. And I think it's just a natural move for the point that you just said, more, you know, the RET, the, the MET drug will be approved when we start getting these other uh, uh, drugs approved. The NTRAC was just approved. You, you, there's no really 
choice now to move to NGS sequencing. It's it's more cost effective. It's tissue sparing. So I, I think that we're 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 getting there, and I'm hoping that the uptake is is uh, really going to continue to be high. Yeah, and I would agree <clears throat> with with that. I would say with some of the work that we're doing, particularly in the community setting. Um, some of the more progressive mm -hmm. community centers yeah. are most definitely doing right. what you're doing, right. but some of the more rural ones where a large majority of lung cancer patients are being yeah. seen, sometimes quite often way more frequently than they should or not even be offered treatment, let alone yeah. testing, which is a really, really sad state of affairs and yeah. something that we're, yeah. we're so, all continuing some to Some of my, on. again, I always say this, it's heartbreaking yeah. to me <laughs> to uh, not do the testing we know in the United States that testing is about 82 to 87 for EGFR. It drops to 70% for ALK, 27% for ROS1, and then we have no data on the rest of them. So uh, that's kind of probably. But I would be curious to see, even see what's happening in Montana. Like, are they doing this testing? Is it comprehensive? Is it? Yeah, no. see. Yeah. But we but, need to do it because yes. how do we know who qualifies for a clinical trial yeah. if we're not testing well, more patients again, for all of the markers? Yeah. My last slide on my talks when I talk about this is, again, I'm trying to get this slogan going, test and treat. That's my mm -hmm. TNT, mm -hmm. test and treat. That's my slogan. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether it will work, but it's I didn't true, think it was I too like bad. It. I didn't I think like it was it. too bad. It may not be perfect, yeah, but, guess you know, that's <laughs> entry. Yeah. I've, I've had, uh, over the last 10 years, I've had five uh, comprehensive sequences done, mm -hmm. and I get it every time I have progression because mm -hmm. to see yeah. if anything's changed. Because from what I understand, it, uh, tumors exposed to treatment mm -hmm. can mutate. That's and I've true. got a lot of friends that have mutated from no driver mutations to mm -hmm. ALK, uh, mm -hmm non-small cell mm -hmm. to small cell, so mm -hmm. so I, I always try to get one every time I have progression. That's an important yeah. thing, Dr. Kelly, if yeah. you want to kind of talk on about rebiopsying, when to retest. Yeah, so I do think that, and I also tell the patients this all the time too, is that if your tumor progresses, we absolutely need to retest, mm -hmm. all right? We try to do the liquid biopsy first, you know, when we know what we're looking for. But we, we also recommend a tissue if the liquid biopsy isn't going to give us the answer. So yes, and of course the explanation is the same, is that we still want to do precision treatment you know, for you. It sounds like you've had lots of those, but nothing's panned out. Yeah, so, so my issue is the drugs have worked Awesome. Except for in my body. Yeah, except for up and here. not particularly well in, in the head. brain. Right, right. And they're in places where it just makes absolutely no sense mm -hmm. to do a brain biopsy. Absolutely, yes. So that's really off the table. Mm -hmm. So we've tried blood biopsies said twice, that. even with pretty large volumes, so they could yeah. try to spin something down, and that was that's useless. And then they even did a trial on trying to spin down. Spinal fluid, I went you, in and got like a, I think it was a 20cc yeah. yep. um, tap, tap. tap yeah. which is actually a lot of fluid. And again, the, you know, the initial testing was really not much there. Mm -hmm. Then it went out to testing um, at a special mm -hmm. lab and they spun it down or whatever mm -hmm. and couldn't get enough, mm -hmm. enough uh, data. Mm -hmm. And because cancers, you know, from a lay person's point of view, start at relatively simple, mm -hmm. and then as you're throwing different treatments at it, they keep getting more and more complex. Mm -hmm. The data from the very beginning when, you know, back in 14, mm -hmm. I think they did a fish test or something. Mm -hmm. It wasn't yep, even that sophisticated, because mm -hmm. it was five years ago. Mm -hmm. um, they found out I was ALK, mm -hmm. but since then, since this is all stable, mm -hmm. they've got right. nothing to go on. Right. And clearly it's mutated, mm -hmm. but we don't know in what direction. Yeah, you, you do have a unique situation. I mean, the, but we still do have, you know, lorlotinib is still, still That's out. the next Which one, does I'm on forget, I'm on forget nib so, now. I know, so there's lorlotinib mm -hmm. and there'll be more to come. You and know? that does so, cross the blood And that does barrier. cross, and, mm -hmm. and though I can see that, that is, you're, you're very unique as, as you already know, and that's very frustrating, but 
The good news is, is that we, deal, we still do have drugs. And I'm sorry, have you had chemotherapy at any point? I have not, and that okay. is on the table. J and we also, from the very beginning, I've always, I mean, I have a pretty positive attitude yeah. anyway, but I've always had the attitude of, well, all I need this drug to do is work long enough to get to the next, the next best thing. Yeah. And then I need that one to work long enough to get to the next best thing, and so on. And <laughs> the drugs have actually been coming to the table faster than I've been going through them. Mm -hmm. So I'd say, you know, doing pretty good. Yeah, yeah, I think, uh, but just, just as a backup, <laughs> right? just as that backup plan, the good news is that Pemetrexate does cross that blood-brain barrier. You know, so, so that, is, that is good. So just as a backup. Yeah. Plan wanna, C or D. <laughs> I want to pause really quick and check in with Amy and Michelle to see if there's any online questions before. Fifty percent, mm -hmm. but EGFR negative, ALK negative, KRAS negative. So the question is, you know, it sounds like kind of these sequential tests almost. And I'm kind of reading into what she's saying, but what would your recommendation be? Further testing to rule out the other kind of approved targets, or given a PDL one of fifty percent, do you kind of yeah. go on those negative results and move to IO? So I'm sorry, did you say she was squamous? What did you no, say? She's uh, adding stage three A, not a small cell. So, so. So, yeah, so I would go ahead and get the remainder of the test because uh, again, you'll find a her too. You'll find her. You will find some of these others. Exon twenty. Exon twenties. You know, N track. You will find them. So I, for to, adenocarcinomas really should have that compre comprehensive testing. Then if she doesn't have anything, then you can move with the uh, immunotherapy. I'm glad I was saying the same thing you just said. So, <laughs> right. so, so Bonnie, exactly. I do want to go back to the question that you were raising about uh, with the commercials about the immunotherapy. You're right. Patients come in, my EGFR patients, they come in and say, I, I want to switch <laughs> yeah. to, to the, I want to switch to that. And so, uh, you know, I have to explain to them that um, this, that's not the right therapy for you right now. And that it is true, and this has already been said, that patients who have these actionable mutations like EGFR and ALK uh, don't really honestly do well with these drugs by themselves, I would say, FYI. Um, even when you have that high percentage. So if you're gonna do immunotherapy, uh, I would combine it with something. So one of the regimens that's out there that I have actually had good luck with has been uh, the regimen, it's called the quad now. I know that sounds, well, it is, it's four drugs. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's the chemo plus the bevacizumab plus the um, uh, atezolizumab or Pembro or whichever one you want mm -hmm. to, to do there. But the, the trial looked at Taxol, Carbo, Bev, and um, Atezolizumab. And, you know, I personally like that regimen myself in patients who are EGFR mutated. I have a patient, you know, I, I have a patient, and just like you guys, I, the second the scan comes up, I'm looking because I know when my scans are coming up. And so I looked at my patient who I'm, I'm going to see tomorrow. And I already looked at his scans, and he's had a, a really great response to that quad. Now, I have to dose modify the chemotherapy. Again, I do do a little modification for, for my patients. Um, and, and he's not my first patient who has had really good responses. Now, again, this is my own personal experience. So for me, if you have a mutation, um, and you want an immunotherapy, I would do it in combination with the, like the quad regimen or some 
And we're going to make sure that Barb hears exactly yeah. that same yeah. thing. Oh, yeah. She's and the dosing, yeah. the dosing is really, really important because years ago they didn't do that. And they yeah. put yeah. men and women on the exact same dose. And it's like, even I know that's stupid. Well, you know, we're smaller. <laughs> we need less, less toxicity. You know, it's crazy. Yeah. And, you know, dosing is. And, and again, remember, deal. there's not one set dose in chemotherapy. There's always a, an efficacious dose range. Right. So particularly when I'm giving the quad, uh, the patients that I've treated, I have dose reduced the chemo piece. Yeah. Be because of, you know, I am concerned about toxicity and making sure that they, they can do, they can handle it. Yeah. Uh, so my point being is, is that the immunotherapy, I think it is in everybody's armamentarium at some point, even the mutation patients, but I would not do it by itself, even when you have a high uh, pd one Right. That's, that's my... So one of the things I, I we're, we're, believe it or not, getting not super... Well, we have 15 minutes left. Okay. Yeah. Um, but one of the things I really, really want to touch on, because I think it's important and there's a lot of promise being shown and it's going to be really impactful for a lot of people is some of the evolving therapies mm -hmm. happening, particularly in KRAS yes. and then in RET. So if you yeah. could talk a little bit about that. So I think, you know, mm -hmm. this year at ASCO, which is our national meeting, um, you know, in previous years, it's always been about immunotherapy, but this year it was really about the targeted therapies and about all the exciting things. Again, newer drugs for MET, uh, newer drugs for ROS1, uh, repotrectinib, I love that name. It just sounds like it's gonna kill tumor cells. I, I, like don't you dinosaurs. Think, don't you think? It yeah. just sounds like it's just gonna kill the tumor cells. Mm -hmm. I think every drug should have that name that sounds like it's gonna <laughs> kill a tumor cell. Um, uh, the RET drugs, blue and uh, Loxo, and but the most exciting data that was presented, not even in the lung cancer session, of course, in the session going on at the same time, so none of us could even go to it, was the the uh, Amgen drug for KRAS. G twelve C. It's an oral drug. It's a TKI, and the trial was the very first trial. It's called these first in human studies, and so it had patients who had G twelve C, but colon cancer has that as well, and there are other tumors and skin and skin, yeah, and yeah. there are other tumors that have that. So nonetheless, there were 10, 10 patients. These ten patients has created a storm. 10 patients and five of them had dramatic responses huge. to this KRAS huge. drug. It's huge. Um, and so now there is just excitement around the world. KRAS is the most common driver mutation in adenocarcinoma. Mm -hmm. So this is huge. And so uh, again, everybody is wanting to get that, that drug at their, their institution in a clinical trial. So and we had the we'll, CEO in our office last week. Oh, great. On, great. Yeah, 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 so, yeah. Right, so, so more to come on that story. But this is, again, the power of technology and drug development, understanding how to look at these biological pathways and be able to mm -hmm. learn how to get into these pockets, these enzyme pockets. And how important clinical trials yes. are. Yes. Maybe you could say a little bit about that because sometimes yeah. people are afraid to go yeah. into a clinical trial. Yeah, yes. Really, again, we, we encourage every patient to, to go into a clinical trial because that's how we can get these drugs the fastest to everybody, all right? So, so it is really important to help us, help everybody, help you too, uh, to, by participating in these clinical trials. Uh, the reasons why, again, we learned so quickly about these targeted therapies is because patients did quickly go on. I will say that uh, drugs like the KRAS drug, and uh, we have a big phase one program at UC Davis as well as Stanford and UCSF, but if those trials open, I would suspect 
in one week they'll be closed because every patient's going to want to go on that those that drug. But that should be true of any of our targeted mm -hmm. drugs, not just KRAS. Mm -hmm. So when we have a great drug, like the blue drug or the LOXO drug or the uh, MET drugs, again, the faster we can get patients on and get the responses, the faster we get it to all patients. All right. So and the FDA is at, working at, yes. at Yes, monumental like, speed these they, days. And they are ways. recognizing that. And that's because, again, you as patients are demanding mm -hmm. that. I think truly the FDA has, has heard your voices and has, you know, your voices and said, not acceptable. Mm -hmm. We got to move forward. Ten years. But... Again, if you're going to say that, you've got to be willing to participate in the clinical trials yeah. too. So, it, you know, it really, we, we, need, we need it all. Yeah, and we try to drive that home at almost yeah. every living room. Yeah. Somehow clinical trials comes back into the conversation because, as you have all heard me say, ad nauseum and folks watching online, yes. it is so, oh, so important in it, order to get these things fast it, track because fast, it is an exciting time right now. It is an exciting time. And so, you know, that is, that is so yeah. true. And we're so, all working together to do that. So on clinical trials, mm -hmm. in this whole journey, the two and a half years that I was first time in humans mm -hmm. on X396, mm -hmm. um, it was by far the best mm -hmm. That's quality said. of life of yeah. the entire What is um, X396? Journey. <laughs> X396, I think it's called Encertinib. It, it's yes. not approved yet. Yeah. It's um, you know still in trials. But I was in the first study of 100 people. I was like patient 60 or something. Mm -hmm. um, there's a few other people in our ALK group that are still on it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's still going through trials. I think they're in like third mm -hmm. phase now. Mm -hmm. yeah. But um, it was a great That's drug. Nice. And, and really, it is good for people to do trials. Yes. Uh, and so we do. And we do. Remember, as a patient, I just want to remind you, key messaging here is that your doctor really should always be giving you the clinical standard of care option and the clinical trial option. You should be getting both, you know. Or if they if they say to you, "Here's a clinical uh, the standard of care," they should at least say, "I don't have a clinical trial for you at my institution." Uh, they should at least say that and say, but you could look other places. Now, one of the things that we do at UC Davis, and because we are fortunate to, to really be in log logistically placed with UCSF and Stanford, and we know each other every so well, in the middle of clinic, we're calling, you know, hey, Joe, Dr. Neil, you know, hey, Matt, hey, Heather, yeah. you know, hey, I've got this patient. We don't have the trial here. You guys have it. Uh, so I have patients at uh, both both places because maybe we don't have that trial, and they have patients at us at our side because we have the trial. So it works both ways, yes, and, and that mm -hmm. is really beautiful because we know each other so well, and and we will give the patients the UCSF option and the Stanford option and see what they have. Yeah, and we I talk think, to them all the time. Yeah, and I think and some of you know this because we've talked about it before. The the a program that UC Davis has put up with some community yeah, hospitals yeah. spreading out pretty mm -hmm. far and wide around doing what's called a virtual tumor board, mm -hmm. um, or they used to be called tumor boards, they yeah, changed yeah. it, yeah, I don't know. Um, but where, where the academic docs get to talk with the community mm -hmm. docs and they get to kind yeah. of share those right. cases back and forth and really get to come to a, right. a unified, yeah. informed decision about right. the patient yeah. population, yeah. which is a huge, huge thing, and I'd love to have another conversation living room around I, I, that, I how mean, to make it work, yeah. especially for places like, like Montana. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we are fortunate right here in Northern California because we do have powerhouses on the research side in lung yeah, cancer. We do. You so have to have very cancer. This is the place to have it. Yeah, mm -hmm. Fortunate about that. Well done. I was just going to say you made a really important point because actually I'm going to uh, try to set up a point with Dr. Gandera yeah. next week for a clinical trial. And I didn't know that you guys worked with UCSF mm -hmm. and Stanford. Mm -hmm.
board. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know Dr. Neal and, and Heather. Yeah. So that's great, great to know that. Um, yeah. And I'm on Medicare. I'm with Kaiser. And mm -hmm. my oncologist told me, you know, if you're on Medicare, you can go anywhere you want for a mm -hmm. clinical trial. So I would say we, we work with Kaiser. Again, I think some of these are misnomers. We have many Kaiser patients on our clinical trials, particularly in the phase one type of setting. Uh, so what we do is uh, all the research studies are done at UC Davis, but your scans, the blood work, it's all done at Kaiser. So it, it is a win-win. You work together. We talk to your doctor. We collaborate where we can. We, we get the approvals. So we, we work really hard to collaborate, and that's actually gone well, I would say. So um, we don't have any problems working with Kaiser, actually or Sutter, or uh, Mercy, or, or any of the groups. We, we don't have a problem with, with doing that, and we're happy, we're happy to do those Which things. Which is huge. Yeah. Tony, do you have a question? Oh, I yeah. just wanted to make a comment that if you don't have that type of relationship with your um, oncologist, or if they're not that type of person, mm -hmm. or if you're in an outlying place, that I uh, learned about uh, a clinical trial available to me by calling the GoTo Foundation, mm -hmm. and Melanie put me yep. in touch with a Lung man who is back yep. east in Washington, mm -hmm. D.C., and we uh, sat down and he talked. We talked through what would be my next, you know, course of action. Yep. I decided we decided that probably a clinical trial at this time would not be good, and mm -hmm. that I should go on brigatinib. Yep. But just in case you're someplace and you don't feel like you can get that help call go to because they are the uh, place to go to. Yeah. Yeah. I the go to the yeah. 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 So the Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. But there's also a trial at UCSF and now open at UC Davis uh, as well. So FYI about, about that, too. There is one trial that's open. It's a combo study. So yeah. Joel, Joel and uh, Jonathan are running, Great. running that study. Um, yeah. So I hate to stop this robust conversation. Right. But we are about four minutes left in tonight, and I have a couple of things, a couple of housekeeping things that I want to go over. Um, hopefully over dessert, Dr. Kelly will be able to stay for a little bit and answer yeah. maybe a couple of questions before she has to get in the car and get back to uh, Davis, Sacramento area. Um, so some uh, upcoming events next. Before we get into the event events, I want to talk about some of the next living rooms. Uh, next week in Washington, D.C., Michelle and I uh, will be out with Dr. Levy um, from Johns Hopkins. Ben uh, Levy, amazing. Yeah. Is that what I said? You said Levy, I said Ben. Oh, doctor, I said Dr. Levy, Dr. Yeah. Benjamin, if we're getting very technical <laughs> and, and appropriate about it. He's great. Um, he's great. He's yeah. done a living room out here before um, uh, locally, but we'll be in D.C. It will be live streamed, uh, same time, only East Coast. Um, so any of you who uh, want to join in and listen to what's going on there, the topic is navigating the journey of lung cancer from treatment to diagnosis and beyond. Um, he will also have his thoracic cancer nurse navigator, uh, Candace Graham Adderton, um, and the uh, medical oncologist nurse practitioner. That's Candace, sorry, the nurse navigator. Uh, nope, sorry. Nurse practitioner is Rashida Persinger Adams. I'm trying to read quickly and backwards. Um, anyway, that's August 29th next week. September 17th, we'll be back here in this office with Dr. Neal from Stanford. We've talked mm -hmm. a lot about him. Uh, we're going to have an entire meeting around um, immunotherapy. So even if you're on a targeted therapy and it's working perfect, we expect to see each and every one of you in your <laughs> seats uh, so you can go back and spread the word about what you learned to other people um, that you may come across during this journey. September 19th, we will be in Toronto, Canada. Um, at uh, Princess Margaret Cancer Center with uh, Dr. Francis Shepard and also Dr. Natasha, um, I'm going to mess up this name, Lael. Lael, yes, yeah. whom I haven't met. I do know Dr. Shepard, but I have not he, who yet is met great. Dr. Lael, so great. I'm very excited um, to meet with them. And they're going to be talking about um, New Hope in Lung Cancer Research, so they're going to kind of step back a little bit and talk a little bit more about what's coming down the pike. So we're really, really excited about that. And then Next month, I'll talk to you about October, and we're get, Michelle and I are going to be down at um, the International Association for the Study of Lung Cancer, um, the South America meeting. We're going to be doing a living room all in Spanish 
from the Ooh. meeting down in Mexico City, which should be Danielle pretty interesting. Danielle took a crash course. Yes, no, no, Danielle <laughs> did not. Let's hear, Danielle, Danielle, Let's hear your Spanish. Danielle is right, relying heavily <laughs> on uh, Dr. Reyes Lewis and uh, some of his, his buddies down there in South America. So that'll be really exciting. But I want to introduce you guys to Bridget, and I don't want to put her on the spot, but if I could get her a mic, because this is the, for her first living room. She's She's been with our team um, for a little bit now, and she's going to give you a little bit of um, somebody grab her mic, Don. You're somebody. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm so thrilled to be here. This has just been a wonderful night tonight. Thank you all for sharing your stories and for being here. I'm really excited to share that our largest run walk that the GoTo Foundation has is coming up September 22nd at Lake Merced here in San Francisco. And then we have our we have three more coming up for the rest of the year, October 6th in Philadelphia at the Philadelphia Zoo. So for anyone in the, on the East Coast, that's our one coming up there. And then we have two more coming up, Houston, Texas, and Hollywood, Florida on November 2nd. So we hope you'll be able to come out to those events. And then I'm excited for my colleague Susan here to tell you about our upcoming marathon events we have coming up. Hi, Susan. Sure, thanks. Um, as Jason mentioned um, in his introduction, he's one of our 16 runners that um, have fundraised to have a place in the New York City Marathon. And so um, we'll be out there November 2nd. So if you're in the New York area, please come out and cheer on our runners who are fundraising. And, you know, I think you certainly mentioned really well that you're living from treatment to treatment, right? And um, those treatments and those breakthroughs come through only because we're funding them as a community. And we're also advocating to get a bigger piece of the pie from federal funds as well. Well, those programs do take funding as well as clinical trial, concierge, et cetera. So um, in addition to that, that marathon. We also, if a uh, full marathon isn't your jam, we have a 10K and a half marathon in wine country coming up in October. And we also have the Air Force marathon um, and half marathon mm -hmm. happening on the East Coast next month. Mm -hmm. So, and if none of that is of interest to you, just like Don did, um, you can turn anything that you love to do into a fundraiser, mm -hmm. any celebration into a fundraiser, and we can help you do that. Um, we certainly had one for um, an anniversary for weddings, et cetera. So um, let us know how we can help you continue these programs. And Susan, this isn't your first living room. No, this is no, my second. Even. Did you introduce yourself last time? Do you want to? I did, a... um, okay. but I'm a 21-year lung cancer survivor as well. Um, I was diagnosed when I was 32 and a brand new mom. Certainly was not wow. expecting expecting it, just like all of you in the room. So um, it, it's thrilling to still be um, a part of this community, but particularly in the last couple of years to see um, the advances that have happened. And it's been because of this spirit of asking for more, demanding more, wanting more, and coming together to ensure that there's more. And um, it's exciting to be a part of this joint um, community now and really see the advances multiplying. So it's really exciting. Thanks, Susan. Um, one last thing I want to talk about. Um, some of you know Francis um, Spruitt and his lovely, lovely Rosalind. They come to this meeting quite often. Um, they are hosting a Wine Hard, Breathe Easy event um, <laughs> on Saturday, September 28th. Yeah, Bonnie's got her hand up um, at their home out in Hercules. So. Um, anyone who's interested in participating in that event. It is a wine tasting event, obviously. Um, they are asking for a $20 donation. Of course, it's not mandatory, but they're asking for it because they are trying to raise funds um, that, that will go right back out the door to help fund research and patient services and programs. But wine hard, breathe easy. If anybody is interested, please reach out to me, and I will uh, give you the information on that. And then the second thing I want to, or the last thing I want to bring up before I thank everybody, um, is an event that's happening. Some of you know about the, um, the meeting that's happening um, in New York City, and it's the, it's the annual New York Lung Cancer Symposium. One of the things that's unique about it and why I want to point it out this year is because I think it's important to some of you in the room and some of you watching, maybe particularly from the New York, uh, greater New York area, is that they've added a patient track this year. Um, and 
when I first heard about it, I was like, oh, it's one of, it's like, it's like the last hour on the last <laughs> of day. Course. Nobody's yeah, gonna, gonna come. come. But it's literally an entire day and the agenda looks amazing. So mm. anyone who is interested as a patient or caregiver in going to that, um, I, I have the information um, for you. Cure um, is sponsoring it. Um, and not like I, I mean, we love Cure. We have a great relationship and partnership with them. But I'm really excited about this day, so I wanted to make sure to share it with you. When is it? Uh, November 9th. Yeah. I'll be yeah. there. I'll be there. Yeah. yeah. It's that weekend. It's the same as our gala. So those of you in the room might not be able oh, to make it. Oh, it's the same as your gala. Make it. Go on um, our gala. Some of our, some of our <laughs> East Coast colleagues are going to be up there. So there will be representation from GoTo at the meeting. But I just thought it was important um, because I really was excited about the patient track thinking, oh, they, they actually put a lot of thought into this. So it's great. Um, huge thank yous. We're going to come to the thank yous and then we're going to eat cake and finish our wine. Sally, thank you for cake. Always. Yeah. I saw that you put a big go-to shout out on the top of the cake, so I really, really, <laughs> really, really thank you for that. Um, obviously, num first and foremost, thank you to patients and caregivers, everyone in the room, everyone watching live tonight, everyone who comes back and watches um, the recorded post-live sessions. Again, I'll say it, you are why we do this. Thank you for continuing to come, in, to, continuing to come back. Um, and supporting us in supporting you. It, 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 it's, it's what you, tonight is why we do what we do, right? Tonight is why we do what we do. Um, thank you, obviously, to Dr. Karen Kelly oh. um, for coming out. Thank you out. guys, thank you guys. Um, <laughs> thank you guys. And having what I really feel like was a very personal, connective, easy to understand conversation around biomarker testing and why it's so important. So huge, huge thank you to her. Obviously, Peninsula Television, the crew that comes in here every month, sets up the station, the, the film crew in the backyard. If you look up here, you see it all. That's what's all set up in the back room. A huge thank you to Penn TV for coming out. For those of you that do live locally, Channel 26, this meeting, just like every other meeting, will replay over and over and over <laughs> until we record this again next month and the new one comes up. So. As Bonnie says, when you are awake at 2 o'clock in the morning and you have nothing else to do. You can see us on TV. Okay. Rewatch re this meeting and watch yourself, watch yourself on TV. Um, thank you to the Office Bar and, Bar and Grill once again for um, bringing in the food. Thank you to Kim Shapoyster. I don't know where she is. Cleaning the kitchen, for I hope. Getting the food all set up, getting the room set up, making sure you all have wine, which is one of the most important things. Um, huge, huge thank you and shout out to Kim. And then, last but most Definitely not least, and this I need my glasses to read from the list, is the, the, the people who support this so that we can actually bring this to you every month. So a huge thank you to Abby, Amgen, AstraZeneca, Bear, Boehringer, Ingelheim, Bristol Myers Squibb, Celgene, Dignity Health, Foundation Medicine, Genentech, Lilly, Medtronic, Merck, Novartis, Takeda, and Tesaro. They all believe in this because they all believe in you. So a huge thank you to all of them. And with that, let's go have a cake. Yeah. Okay. Let's eat cake. Oh, one more thing. <laughs> oh, I'll be brave if you're brave. I'll be brave, but only if you're brave. And it could be Just you and me We'll be family Just wait and see So I will fight if you'll fight yeah, I will fight, but only if you'll fight. Oh, we can make it through this like sailors in a tempest. Like sailors in a tempest together. And it could be just you and me will be family just wait and see